Hi, so now we're on page five and I'm going to introduce the concept of measures and bar lines. So if you look at this example on the top of page five, it's blank. There's no music written there. Okay, I just wanted to show you the measures. This is a four measure example. Okay, so there's measure one, two, three, and four. Those measures are divided by bar lines. Okay, and that's the vertical line in between the measures. Okay, this will make more sense as we see a piece of music. But for now, understand what measures and bar lines are. Moving down the page, you'll see that different styles of notation and different music publishing houses, different composers, you're going to encounter different kinds of bar lines, but some things are universally accepted. One is that when you see the thick double bar at the end of the piece, that means the end. Okay, So when you, if you don't see that in my book, if you don't see the thick double bar there, it means turn the page, it's going to keep going. The, page, the piece hasn't ended yet. Something that I use and a lot of uh, music publishers use is I use thin double bars occasionally to show you that something's changing in the piece, right? If you've ever heard the terminology of go to the bridge or the chorus or the verse, I like to put those double bars in just so if someone's reading my music, they can see, oh, something's going to change here. The feel's going to change. The chords, the harmony might change. It's just a heads up to make the reading of the music easier. That's optional, but you will see those a lot of the time. It doesn't mean to do anything. You keep going, but it just means something's changing at, the, at that section there. Moving down, you're going to encounter some music that has the left bar line filled in all the time. That's more of a pop or a jazz convention. And then on the right, in classical music, generally we don't have the left side bar line. There's really no difference as to how the music is played, but I wanted to show you both of those so you're not confused if you see both of those. Let's turn to page six. Okay, so now we're on page six, and these are the systems that I mentioned to you before. So if you look at this example, we have two systems. So the systems are the horizontal rows of measures. Okay, so this is called a system. You can look here, we've got two systems with eight measures total, four measures per system. Throughout the book, the systems don't always have the same amount of measures, but generally I try to do that. You'll notice that the second system there at the top, sometimes it's a little bit lower down to the left, sometimes it's underneath the treble clef, we have the measure number, okay? And that's just a convenience for if we're rehearsing something in class, I say go to measure 20. You don't have to count from the beginning. You might see the measure number, you know, 17 and then count in, okay? So those are measure numbers. Okay, but we only write it in at the beginning of the system generally and not on the first system because we all know it starts at one. The next thing is the fingers. So our left hand fingers, if you play piano, you're going to have to disregard that. We don't count the thumb, right? In piano, it's one, two, three, four, five. In guitar, it's just one, two, three, four. Okay? The right hand, if you're playing with a pick, this doesn't really matter, but it's good to know anyway. Okay? For classical guitar, around the world, it's P. I M A. And this is from the Spanish. Pulgar, indice, medio, anular. Okay, so excuse my pronunciation if you're a native Spanish speaker. That's not my convention. This is classical guitar. P I M A. And in more complex pieces, you might see right hand fingerings and left hand fingerings written in. So numbers one, two, three, four, and then also P I M A. Now you'll remember I said that we're not going to encounter much tablature in the book, but we will encounter it at times. So I do want you to know how this works. The first difference that you'll see that's huge is, first of all, we don't have the treble clef there, okay? And we have six lines, not five lines. So now this does refer specifically to the guitar. As I mentioned before, the treble clef could be for any treble clef instrument, and those lines do not represent the strings whatsoever, okay? Here it literally does. And what this looks like, if you're looking at the tab, if you flip your guitar this way, this will line up literally with the tab. Okay, so the top line, if you look to the far right, the top line is E, B, G, D, A, E, coming from the top of the page towards the bottom. Okay, and that's going to be E, B, G, D, A, E. So if you get confused, just go like this. That's how it lines up with the book. Now the numbers refer to the frets. It's not your finger. It's not duration, doesn't tell you the note duration as I mentioned before. It's just the location of the note. So the first measure there, first string, third fret. Okay, so the first string is the high E string, and it would be the number three. Doesn't tell you what finger to play it with, doesn't tell you how long it rings for. But that would be this note here. The second measure, there's a number six on the second line there. So that's the sixth fret on our B string. 
Then we have a seven on the D string, and then a one on the low E string. So you may want to review this page, page six, when we encounter tab later in the book.